So with prop collecting at an all-time high, thanks to Planet Hollywood and eBay, we asked Bob what he thinks of the current state of the hobby. Well, my collection, when I got most of my stuff, most of the studios couldn't wait to throw it out. It was just a liability to them. I mean, you've used it, it's done, we don't want it. And then, of course, Planet Hollywood came along and things like that, and all of a sudden the studio said, whoa, wait a minute, this stuff might be worth some money. So now, they don't really get rid of anything unless they sell it themselves or an auction or, or whatever, that type of thing. And so probably if I were collecting new stuff today, which I really don't that much, uh, I would probably have trouble getting it now, you know, because now it's, it's bucks. And, and if I want to, you know, pay $4,000 in an auction, that's fine. But part of the charm of my collection is it all came from people that was given to me, and usually by the person doing the film. And so that means a lot more to me than going out and buying something. That's just not the thing I want to do. Now, collectors, if that's the only way you can get it, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. I've just been very lucky to get the stuff I've gotten the way I got it. Okay, we know most of you are drooling right now, and you probably like to get a tour of Bob's museum. Unfortunately, as it's currently located in his home, it's closed to the public. Until Bob can get it on display elsewhere, we offer you these two alternatives. One is to check out the video tour Bob gave us in another segment on this issue of Movie Effects. And the other is to pick up his new book, aptly titled It Came From Bob's Basement. Yeah, I have a, a book that has just come out called It Came From Bob's Basement. And what it is, is it's pretty much a, a chronicle of, uh, by chronicle books, by the way, a chronicle of, of my props and, and old stories of how I got into the business and that kind of stuff, you know. But the props are what's really cool to see in the book because they're all in color and look really nice. But it's, uh, it was a labor of love. It took a couple of years to do it. Uh, but it, it's, it's fun. I really love it. We are planning now, really, on doing a volume two. I have enough stuff because, uh, you know, there's just so much stuff we couldn't cram into one book. And eventually, my big dream, of course, is having a museum that everybody could come and see. At my age, I'm not too sure I want to see that happen, but I, I, I can sure dream about it. Those of you who have just seen our interview with Bob Burns are probably chomping at the bit for a chance to check out his museum. While the collection is extensive and too big for us to show every item, Bob showed us these highlights. This is pretty interesting. It's not a sci-fi or horror uh, genre piece, but it's uh, one of Charlie Chaplin's original film magazine boxes. Uh, in fact, this is one he used when he was shooting The Gold Rush. It's just one of my favorite pieces just for what it is. That's Charlie Chaplin stuff. It's funny, this has been converted now, you can see, to 16 millimeter, because they used to use this to shoot commercials and stuff in the 16, but it's the one of the original 35 millimeter magazines that they used to use. It was the one that was actually in here originally. This is Bishop from Aliens. This is the android when he gets torn in half by the queen, and this is one of the trimmer's worms that the guys at ADI gave me that, and I figured, well, Bishop needs a home, and the worms eat people, hey, why not? Put him in there. And and he's been there ever since. And they seem to get along okay. It's not bad. This is interesting. This is a thing that Giger made up uh, for the original Alien. This is the space jockey. This is what they call a maquette of what the big set was going to look like. What they would do is they would literally turn this different ways to make this wall look like it was behind it all the time. And they only had to build that much of the wall, really. Uh, this is from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. A friend of mine, Tommy Sherman, uh, built this for me. It's uh, the same size as the 11-footer uh, from the movie. Unfortunately, uh, Tom passed away before he could get it finished, so some uh, special effects prop guys, friends of mine, are going to finish it for me someday because it was one thing that Tom always felt real bad about that he couldn't, couldn't get it finished. But This is from Fly 2 that Chris Wallace did. It's when the little kid starts growing up very fast and he builds this really, really strange-looking helmet. It's only in for a couple of scenes. This is from The Arrival. This is a maquette. Of course, the effects were actually done CGI, but uh, Bob and Denny Skotek gave me that. Here's from Aliens. This is from the sequel. This is uh, one of the, the heads from that. This is from Alien, and it's the same as this one without this covering on it. This is the one the actor actually wore in the film. But uh, that's that one, and this is the stuntman's head without this covering on it. Know that Giger did a lot of stuff using real skulls and things like that. Now this is what I call my animation case. Most everything in here is from a stop motion movie. These three different guys here are the different size of the Loch Ness Monster from Seven Faces of Dr. Lowe. One of my rarest pieces back here is a the study mic maker's wall that they made for the King Kong movie in 32. They actually built this wall to build the big one from and the miniature that Kong walks through. Uh, this is from a, a Doug Beswick film called Ticks. This is interesting because it's the Elasmosaurus head and flipper from Kong. It's the thing that comes up out of the water in, in the, uh, the cave trying to get Fay Ray that he fights. And here we have uh, drums and fiddles and stuff from George Powell's uh, Tubby the Tuba. This is interesting. Rick Baker gave me this. This is from American Werewolf from London. This is when uh, David Naughton is in the theater and all of a sudden he looks at his hand and he's starting to change. 
And so what happens here is he looks here and whoa, these little babies pop right through his nails and his skin. Oh, painful, painful. This spaceship right here is from a film called Flix. It came out on video, didn't even go to the theaters, and I think it went to the toilet after that. I think it's a pretty bad movie. But here's the small version of the Nostromo that was hooked to the big refinery set. This is one of the flying subs that was actually used uh, to do flying scenes from Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. This is the, the saucer that I worked with, with Paul Blaisdell. This is the Invasion of the Saucer Men saucer. Now in the movie Alien, uh, they wanted to make the space jockey look bigger than it was, so they used children. In fact, I heard it was uh, Ridley Scott's kids. I'm not sure it was or not. Then they scaled down the spacesuits and these kids wore them. And you saw them first climbing up on, on the space jockey, so it made the space jockey look half again as big. And then, of course, they would go to the regular actors with the jockey, and you couldn't tell how big it was. So they actually used these, these costumes and scaled them down. Here's the big V-ship here, the big model, rather large model. You don't make them this big anymore. A lot of detail on it. Now here is uh, Stripe uh, from Gremlins. It's how he ends up in the end of the film when the sun hits him and he turns into a skeleton. Now here's something interesting, combination anyway. The T-1000 from Terminator 2, that was the one that was used in the helicopter, I believe. And the baby, zombie baby, from Peter Jackson's Dead Alive. Peter Jackson was over one day and was talking to me. Rick Baker brought him here and he said, I gotta go to my car, I've got something I wanna show you. And he brought this baby back in and said, you must have this for your museum. And I said, must I? Now these are some of the costumes I have from different movies. Uh, the one with the bullet helmet, that's my character, Major Mars, that I did years and years ago. It was a little thing I did at the stage show and we did a little short featurette. And then there is the Flash Gordon shirt from the Flash Gordon serial. Rocky Jones Space Ranger, that uh, you'd have to be older, as old as me to know what that is, I think. Up above is Glenn Strange's uh, Frankenstein boots from Abbott Costello meet Frankenstein that Glenn gave me years ago. And down in front here, we have a lot of different things. There's a dead drac from Enemy Mine that Chris Wallace did. Here's the body from uh, the American Werewolf. It's the one where David Naughton had his arms and head through the stage floor and then they would wiggle wiggle the body around. And uh, this is Naked Lunch. This is one of the uh, mugwumps. This is a uh, panther from Greystoke that Rick did, and I put him by uh, Patrick Swayze from Ghost. And then, of course, we have the full-size werewolf guy. It's so cool. That's when he's complete, and he's running down Piccadilly Square doing all the stuff he's doing. They had a guy actually in there wearing it, and his hands would go to the elbows of the werewolf. And it was in the cantilever thing. It had wheels on it, almost like a wheelbarrow in the back. And guys would puppet this thing and move it. And the fellow wearing this thing could have his head buried in here. And he would do this with his arms. And it made it look like he was actually crawling and moving along. And we have a uh, helmet from Rocketeer and a gun from Forbidden Planet and things like that. And these heads down here, the big bug-eyed guys, things Rick Baker did years ago, everybody thinks they were in Star Wars. They really aren't. He did them way before Star Wars, just as a fun thing. And uh, then we have Uncle Creepy and Cousin Eerie, a friend of mine made for me that are really cool looking. Everybody thinks they came from Disneyland, but they were before Disneyland from the old EC Comics, of course. A pair of Harry's feet from Harry and the Hendersons. There's a Arnold head, sans hair, for Terminator 2. And a bunch of life casts of different people. There's Sean Connery, Arnold, of course, Lon Chaney Jr., just a lot of, lot of folks. This guy's interesting. He's from Arachnophobia. He's the guy that's in that box when they send back the body that the spiders are actually in is how they get out. And that's the body that Chris Willis made on him. Now, this is one of my most interesting pieces that I love because it was the second movie set I was ever on, which was Destination Moon in 1949. And it's very interesting because it's in relief, so as you pan along it, you can actually see a definition between here and the background with the stars, which are real interesting. And this actually is on wheels, and it actually rolled by the camera. And it kept it all in registration, of course. And there was just a spot behind here. Now, we lit it up with fiber optics to show it this way. Here's some interesting things that I kind of put in a case here because they're, they're kind of fragile. Uh, one of the things, arms from the original thing, it's a casting out of the original mold. Uh, Galactica pistol, uh, this spaceship is from Hangar 18. The guys with wings here are actually from Atlantis, the Lost Continent. These are actually cut out of the film. These look great, but the guys themselves, the actors, the cables were too big. Today you get rid of it with CGI, of course, you couldn't then. 
uh, Dr. Lau puppet here. This is the big puppet of the, the serpent that talked to Arthur O'Connell. You can see back here, uh, C-3PO's feet. Now, Rick Baker did those for the first movie, and I wasn't aware of that until he gave them to me years ago. I didn't know he actually did the feet for it. The Santa Claus is interesting. Greg Jean did that for the movie 1941. They had to build all of Hollywood Boulevard in miniature for that film. This is interesting. Here's the Zandy from Outer Limits uh, that Wah Chang did. This is the hero puppet. This is one that you could actually raise the head on and you could with little monofilaments down the tail and make the head look back and forth and all that stuff. The buildings behind there, uh, Bob and Denny Skotek did those for uh, Escape, Escape from New York. York. And this one's interesting here, if you can see it. This is one of the Ghidra heads and tail from the original Ghidra from Toho. Here's, here's one of the icons in the museum, actually. The original King Kong. There he is. A little thinner now. But, uh, anyway, this is the metal armature of Kong. He still kind of moves. You can actually move the fingers if you want. You can actually get those fingers to move. And they would do them one frame at a time. Click it. Fix it again, do another. Uh, I mean, it's, I don't have the patience for doing that. But this is made out of steel. It's very heavy. The head was sand casted in, into metal. It's, like I said, next to the time machine is probably one of the uh, rarest items I have. Now, the very first prop that I ever got, and I was 13 years old at the time, was the cane head from The Wolfman. That's the one Claude Rains bashes Lon Chaney Jr. In fact, Chaney buys it in the beginning of the film, and it's featured all through the movie. And here it is. It's, in reality, made of rubber, because uh, you can see here, and it's still pretty pliable after all these years. Because uh, Cheney had to be beat with it, and they didn't really want to hit him with a real cane, I don't think. Now, of the icons we were talking about next to Kong, this has to be the other one, the time machine. I get people coming from all over the world to see this thing. I, it just for some reason, it, it seems to be very, very popular, and everybody loves it. It's a beautiful piece of furniture. Now, Rod Taylor here is brand new. I've only had him for a few weeks. Henry Alvarez, who makes the best wax figures in the world, and his wife, Andrea, made this up for me to be in the time machine. Andrea does all of the hair work. This stuff is punched in one hair at a time, which is phenomenal. This just completes the time machine now. He used to sit here and just be the chair. Now we've got him sitting in it, and it's like one of my absolute favorite things in the world. We did this creature for our Halloween show in 1982, and this is the last casting out of the Ben Chapman mold at Universal, the land creature, and then they destroyed the mold right after this. Now, the, the suit itself, Bill Malone reconstructed the suit, and it's, it's like scale for scale. It's almost one-to-one. -one. In fact, Ben Chapman, who played the land creature, has been over a couple of times, and he said, is this one of my suits? It feels like it, because it's foam. We did it out of foam. And so Greg Nicotero put it on this dummy for me and made this little environment for him and the whole thing, and there he is. It's just so cool. Here is the original gantry for Destination Moon. Now this ship is a redo that uh, Lou Zuderman did for me. The original ship, along with a lot of stuff, got burned in the Bel Air fire at George's home years ago, unfortunately, and he lost everything. So Lou did this, but he had the, the gantry. What's interesting about this gantry is it's made out of welding rod, and all of the little cross members you see in here are threads glued in one at a time. I mean, that had to be a job. It took like two months to build this thing. That's the original clock in the title sequence of the time machine. You see all these clocks go by, and I thought they went over to England and shot a plate. And Phil Keller said, geez, Bob, they've been half our budget to do that. We couldn't afford that. Now, these are, these are matte paintings here from the time machine. That's the outside of the Great Hall and the inside of the Great Hall, painted by Bill Brace over at Project Unlimited. These are some of the storyboard art here before they actually had the stuff locked in of what it was gonna look like. There's an animation sheet here. A lot of the stuff outside the skylight was all stop motion. So you can see day, night, day, night, all this stuff written on here. This is my time machine corner, I guess you'd call it here. Now here's an old relic, comes way back, uh, before any of you guys were born. It's the original Martian intelligence from Invaders from Mars. Now here's the bat boat from Batman Returns that Bob and Denny Skotek did. This is the size of the miniature. It was rather large because they had to shoot it in this sewer thing, and so it had to be pretty big to carry focus. These characters here are very interesting. Uh, this is just a gnome thing that Rick Baker did just for fun. And there was a bear for a pilot thing he did. I mean, Rick's always messing around with stuff. Even his messing around stuff is always the coolest stuff you've ever seen. That's the stuff he's just playing with. 